Hey, it's Mazzy again, and um, happy, happy end of 222. We're approaching the holidays, the new year, and I just thought of, this is like a gift guide, or whether you buy these things for yourself or for uh, loved ones who are really into music. Did your parents ever say to you, why don't you just read a book once in a while? <laughs> Put down the record, stop the music and read a book. Now, of course, you can, certain books you can read to music, and sometimes if it's a lot of lyrical content, for me at least, I can't read a book, but I can look at picture books. So I decided to do uh, my own version of the Holiday Music Gift Guide, Mazzy's Music Book Guide. These are books that I acquired uh, over this last year. A couple of them might have been the end of 2021 that I recommend. Now, there I got other books. Some were sent to me by publishers. Some, a lot, most of them I bought myself. And those of you who've been watching me know I'm a very, uh, very big collector of, I like the archive uh, side also of uh, record making and, and enjoyment. Of course, it's the music, as I always say, but I like the visualization, obviously, since I'm uh, entrenched in photography and design. I love to uh, showcase uh, that side of everything. So I'm going to go through these. I kind of did pile them up, and I have, with a one or two exceptions, actually read and finished every book here. A couple of them I skimmed through. But I've read these books, and I, I have them sort of grouped by biography, autobiography, or biographies on artists, of art books that represent either one artist, a photographer, taking pictures, uh, or art related to, uh, on the fine art visualization of something related to music, as well as essays. And I need to start out with one that I think is maybe the book of the year in terms of essays, because anything... Uh, anytime he puts out something, uh, it's it's an event, and that's obviously Bob Dylan's essay book. He has about 60 essays on songs that he picked, The Philosophy of Modern Song by Bob Dylan. He hasn't had a book out since Volume 1 Chronicles. I'm thinking that's almost 15 years ago now. There hasn't been a Volume 2 yet, and that book really bowled me over, surprised me. It didn't go in, in chronological order, but it, it shot around with different artists in his own his own look at his, obviously, his own uh, musical journey, and I loved it. I loved it, and he seemed less <laughs> obtuse, I'm going to use that word again, or less, but less left of center. I mean, he's got a left center, and when he mumbles, and he, he have, you've seen interviews with him, it almost seems, as coherent as it is, it almost seems incoherent. But that book just bowled me over, and this is really great. There's a visualization of songs of the artist, and he talks uh, about the songs historically, uh, personally, and what what it means to him and what it means possibly to the audience. Obviously, you have the Who's Great Song, My Generation. You have Ruby, Are You Mad, the Osborne Brothers. So it goes from pop to country to middle of the road to classics like uh, Blue Bayou by Roy Orbison, beautifully designed with uh, illustrative uh, photographs and illustrations that represent the artist and the song and Bob's take on these great songs. Long Tall Sally, uh, Little Richard. So early rock and roll, really well done. If you're a Dylan fan, this is a no brainer. This is essential. And this is the philosophy of modern song by Bob Dylan. Put it on your holiday list. Give, Give it as a gift to someone uh, that loves Bob Dylan, just loves popular music. Even if you're not a Dylan fan, and if you're a fan of popular music, that is something to check out. Sticking with sort of the essays and the history, the historic side of it, this is a fabulous book. This is Bob Stanley's Let's Do It. Uh, this is a, a prequel to a book he did from the 1950s rock and roll all the way up to Beyonce, I think. He did the that volume on popular music from the 1950s on to a present day. This is the history of pop music from the beginnings of pop music, from the crooners, from the big band era, uh, from the, the blues and rock singers. And it is a an amazing tome and amazing overview of this great music. And it kind of leads, it tells us how we got where we are now from musically, from that historically, what was happening in the world you know, politically, socially, and how this music came about. So let's do it. 
Of course, that's what the Cole Porter song, Let's Do It, just goes through the whole history of popular music, uh, recorded music and otherwise, radio broadcast, and it's really an essential uh, archive. I mean, this is kind of the, the most prolific uh, overviews of popular music, The sort of the first half. If we, if we divide the last century, this is the first half of the century, and a fantastic, fantastic book. Now, this is something, I do collect Beatle books, and I admit there's some Beatle books that are out there and strange and really not to my... I wouldn't normally get it if it wasn't about the Beatles. And this is an interesting one. This is a little more scholarly, and, and uh, it's theology-based, and it takes artists, uh, two of my favorite artists, and talks about the the sort of the spiritual religious side of the two artists. And um, again, it's U University Press, I believe, Cambridge Press, Cambridge University by John Stewart, not that John Stewart. And it's called Dylan, Marx, and God. And it's exactly what you would think it is, the spirituality of them personally, what they wrote about, obviously Dylan going through his Christianity period, his, um, you know, his Judaism, uh, John Lennon being sort of the, the anti-religious person and his uh, bringing up. Uh, but it, um, it's, it's a scholarly tome and it's not for light reading, but it's really interesting. A lot of bibliography references. If you're coming from the religious side of things, uh, it, it, it's recommended, but it's not light reading and uh, maybe not for everyone of my audience, but you never know. I mean, that's why. Be open to th these things. I read a lot of stuff that maybe I don't agree with or I don't follow as much, but it gives us the education to, uh, to make our decisions. Now, this is a, a book that I really enjoyed reading, and I'm a, a big Yoko fan, and this is called In Your Mind, The Infinite Universe of Yoko Ono. And uh, the writer, Madeline uh, Vaccaro, really tries to uh, make the case, if you're not a Yoko fan, this may make you a Yoko fan. Maybe not musically in listening to her music, but from her art intentions and how she likes to create art pieces. Obviously, she came from uh, sort of the early 1962-63 Fluxus movement, avant-garde art scene, conceptual art scene, around the time musically with artists like uh, John Cage and, and performance artists and visual artists as well as, uh, you know, conceptual artists, where a lot of her early art pieces are creations that go only so far. And it's up to you, uh, the viewer, the reader, the audience to complete that art piece and maybe you don't complete it and maybe everyone completes it different but this is a really good book and I really uh, am a fan of this book you know there it is in your mind Yoko Ono the infinite universe of Yoko Ono I'm a big fan of Leonard Cohen I love everything Leonard Cohen has done and created and you know he can't, he started for pop singers, he started late because he wasn't really a po pop singer. He was a, a, a poet and uh, he wrote some songs and Judy Collins especially championed his early work and brought him on stage to his, um, he didn't really want to perform. And I think the first time he performed, he kind of walked off stage because he's not the voice, he's not the singer. And especially when you're listening to Judy Collins' beautiful uh, rendition of Suzanne and several, se several other of Leonard Cohen's songs, you know how uh, just the dynamic thing and, you know, does Leonard Cohen warrant the beauty of a song? Jennifer Warren's also covered it with a really lovely voice. Of course they do. They're great songs. Hallelujah. We know Jeff Buckley and so on. This is uh, Who by Fire, Leonard Cohen in the Sinai by Matt Friedman. Uh, this is really interesting because it, 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 it covers in uh, 1970. Three, October 73, the Sinai uh, War with Egypt and Israel and the Jewish holiday of Yom Kippur, the Yom Kippur War. And literally, Leonard Cohen goes to Israel in his vision at the time to fight for Israel. Um, Buddhist, Jew, born a uh, Jew, really would study Buddhism more than the Jewish faith, although he uh, was very much a Jew, and uh, in fact, on his last album, his Cantor out of Toronto sings on that great opening track. But this talks about that and how it became this sort of this folk hero with the with the soldiers in the Sinai. Um, it's really an interesting sliver of history of what was going on then, and and it really takes it uh, in the war and what was happening then um, to some uh, 
you know, tragic effect and the joy also that came out of that and the camaraderie. But um, really an interesting read, a, a deeper read, Leonard Cohen and the Sinai, Who by Fire, which t is named after one of his songs, uh, by um, Maddie Friedman. Maddie Friedman, there you go. One of my favorite bands, I have two books here, actually several books by my three favorite bands. This, I like this book. Now, is it definitive story? It's one man's vision, you know, the, the two uh, Davis brothers, and this is uh, Dave Davis of the Kinks, and this is Living on a Thin Line. I don't know if this has come out in America yet. I got a British copy of this, Living on a Thin Line, autobiography of Dave Davis, uh, the uh, obviously Ray's brother, and the great guitar player, Ray, wrote the songs. He played them. He did, sang on some of them, but it was Ray as the lead vocalist. But an integral part, obviously, with Ray and David brothers and the songs and the guitar riffs and just the playing and the, and the higher harmonies that Dave wrote. But this is a book. It, it doesn't shy away from the brotherly rivalry of Ray and Dave, uh, but a fantastic uh, tome as well, Living on a Thin Line, Dave Davis. If you're a Kinks fan, this is... Um, an essential book, if you're a Kinks fan. Dave Davis, Autobiography, 2022. This is Jan Winters, Like a Rolling Stone, a memoir. Of course, whatever you're gonna say about Rolling Stone today, Rolling Stone was a very important music magazine, maybe the important music magazine. Obviously, you know, Cream and Crawdaddy and uh, the, all the all, new rags, the Village Voice and everything else. But Rolling Stone started in San Francisco in 1967. 67, 68, uh, by Ralph uh, J. Gleason, who was the jazz and pop critic for the San Francisco Chronicle, amazing writer, an amazing curator of jazz, and also championed the psychedelic scene with the airplane and the dead and Quicksilver and the and the Bill Graham, all the, the, the shows that were going on in San Francisco he would write about, and records. So he wasn't just a jazz snob, although there is a great PBS show he hosted and produced at a KQED in San Francisco. You can see black and white footage with, with the great Bill Evans and Coltrane. Great, great footage of jazz. And and he started, Jan and um, Ralph J. Gleason started Rolling Stone magazine in San Francisco, 625 Third Street, San Francisco. They moved to New York some years later. Ben Fong Torres was one of the L uh, editors early on. And of course, their first official, the first two photographers were Barry Wollman, who's still around, and of course, Annie Leibovitz, that was her first gig after coming out of the uh, San Francisco Art Academy, Art Institute. This goes over that history. It goes over moving to New York and beco becoming part of the uh, celebrity and social scene of Manhattan. And the reason he moved to New York, good or bad, right or wrong, was to get all the advertisers. You know, San Francisco was considered the left wing, the left coast, and the whole publishing you know, center of the world in publishing was in Manhattan in New York City. So he went there and he got entrenched in that. Good or bad, right or wrong, drugs or not, he got close to some of the artists he wrote about. And he talks about that. Uh, anyway, it's, it is an interesting story. Some of it, you think, oh, God, this guy's full of shit, but he's telling his story from his point of view. It's, it's definitely worth a read if you are very interested. If, like me, we grew up with Rolling Stone. There was a time where I had every interest, I had every uh, copy of Rolling Stone. There's an early picture of, uh, of Amy Leibovitz. And of course, to get into the story of when he interviews John Lennon and he puts the Lennon Remembers, it w John Lennon didn't know he was going to publish that interview. And he did, oh, he put a book out on it. That's what it was. And uh, John Lennon was not very happy with it. So that is that side of the holiday book thing. Now let's go with some visual things, some museum type pieces. I showed this briefly. This is... Uh, Ronald Light's Pedal Culture, Guitar Effects, Pedals, and Cultural Artifacts. This is a visual overview of guitar pedals and accessories. And this was, this just came out early this year, 2022. They've been working on it for some time because this was based on a show that um, Ronald Light curated at San Francisco State University, I believe in 2017. And this talks about various pedals, the various companies that make the pedals. I am not an effects or pedal guru or genius. I have friends that are into it more than I am. I appreciate it. I appreciate the artwork. And some of them are really uh, just interesting, the fuzz pedals and the, 
the whole scene and the history of art pedals. Uh, it's beautifully designed and, and curated and illustrated. And of course, the big muff series and, you know, get into that. Uh, this is one I've skimmed through. I haven't read it from cover to cover, but I've read on various pedals. But this is kind of a cool uh, journey. It says a rich and visual journey and lively exploration into a cultural significa significance and design semiotics of a contemporary guitar effects pedal. Now, if that ain't a niche thing, but there's a lot of you guitar players out there that this would be a great, you know, I'm talking to you, Bob Bradley, a great overview of uh, books. You put it on your Christmas and Hanukkah and any list that you, your birthday list, whatever it is. Uh, cool book, cool book. Pedal Culture, Ronald Light. This is a book that I fell in love with this year and it just was repressed. This was out years ago. I never had the book. I knew his name, but I didn't really know much about him. And this is the late uh, Barney Bubbles. Barney Bubbles was designer, a, a graphic designer, illustrator, art director, who uh, did a lot of great covers in the UK. Here's a, a portrait of him. Beautiful, beautiful artwork here. Now, Elvis Costello uh, projects, Hawkwind albums. This is a fantastic illustrated book. Again, this is where I'm really into the whole curation of art. Nick Lowe, New Wave covers, Dave Edmonds, one of my favorites, obviously, with that great Hasselblad. This is one that had various cover uh, variations back in the day where you could buy like what, three or four different variations of Elvis Costello with the Hasselblad camera, different positions, photo. So it really worked wonderfully in that. So you've seen many of these covers. You've seen his work, even if you don't know his uh, name is uh, Barney Bubbles. And remember, all the stuff done before Photoshop where you can just do layers upon layers upon layers, cut and paste, uh, collage work, and a very favorite of mine. Cool, really, book. This was a repress this year, so if you can find it, it's out of the UK only as far as I know, but it is The World of Barney Bubbles. Graphic design and the art of music. Love that. Now, another overview of art, music, year as art. Four years ago, this book came out, Hi-Fi, by Faden Book, written by Gideon Schwartz. New York, he used to be a lawyer, he's a high-end audiophile fanatic, and this goes in the history of product design of gear. Talks about the years, the decades of all the gear. Now, this came out a few years ago, but he just put out this revolution. This is an amazing book. If you're a turntable freak, if you're a gearhead, this is like a coffee table tome to the art of record players, the art of record players. Of course, the, one of the greatest design pieces, whether you like it or not, audio-wise, Bang & Olsen designs from uh, the early 70s. But it goes to almost every turntable design you could think of. I mean, there are definitely omissions. Of course, I'm a Riga guy. There's a Riga uh, turntables made out of the UK. Goes back to gramophones, goes into the 50s and 60s of consoles, of gramophones, and uh, up to modern turntables today. Not all over-the-top expensive ones. Sometimes you have your low-key Dan sets out of the UK. That's beautiful record player. This is a fantastic book. I would say... Buy these both for the person in your life that loves record players, turntables, vinyl, and music. What a great, you know, don't just get him a friggin' record this year or her. Get him one of these books. Revolution and Hi-Fi. Maybe there's a two, you know what they should do? They should have got a holiday two-pack slipcase. That's what, that's how they sell them to you again, right? So I love that. My Life in Pictures, Patty Boyd, obviously uh, married to George Harrison, met on the set of A Hard Day's Night. Uh, something was written about her. Mary Eric Clapton. Layla's written about her. She was a fashion model. She was hired uh, in a hard day's night to just that, to be, in a way, a prop. But what, what a face. Uh, what a muse. She was photographed by some of the great, great uh, fashion photographers in the 1960s into the 70s. And they've collected this great work. Some of her own photographs. 
She was a photo photographer in her own right and uh, collects a lot of great pictures here for magazines, fashion magazines, uh, beauty magazines, and of course, family shots as well. Again, a nice overview if you're into photography. This is probably not for everyone, but if you're a Beatle fan or just like great photography and you like the whole 1960s aesthetic, you know, Carnaby Street, Mary Quant, Twiggy, that type of thing. This is another uh, aspect. What a face. What a beautiful uh, model here. What a beautiful woman. So Patty Boyd, my life in pictures. I've mentioned the photographer Jim Marshall many times. I knew him for about 30 years. He died about a dozen years ago. And he shot everything from Woodstock to Coltrane Ballads cover to the Woodstock cover to... Uh, Pictures of the Grateful Dead, Jefferson Airplane, The Whole Summer of Love, but a lot of great blues albums, covers. Janis Joplin with, and backstage at uh, Winterland, I believe, with uh, the Southern Comfort Bottle, Janis and Grace Slick, and some of those famous pictures, the famous picture of Johnny Cash uh, flipping off the camera. But this year they put out for a 50th anniversary, um, the Rolling Stones, 1972. Obviously celebrating that tour. I saw this tour at Winterland uh, opening with uh, Stevie Wonder. That's the Exile on Main Street tour. Jim Marshall was the photographer who went with the Stones. And I believe there's a show up right now at the Grammy Museum in uh, Los Angeles about this tour. And this book just came out celebrating the art of um, the photography of J Jim Marshall for the Rolling Stones 1972 tour, Exile on Main Street, tempestuous tour. Knowing Jim, knowing what the Stones were into in those days, I'm sure it was a party every morning, noon, and night. But uh, a great photo essay. There is a wonderful documentary. You can either buy it or you can, I think it's on Hulu, on, um, on Jim Marshall. And you need to, I mean, what a tempestuous uh, uh, person. He was always had a, a couple of Leica cameras around his neck. He used film, never got into the digital world. I have a, own a few of his prints and just and a great artist. Uh, there are several books of his work. There's a Monterey uh, Jazz Festival that came out some years ago. There's the Johnny Cash, uh, Folsom and San Quentin series of photographs. There's just a great overview that came out about two years ago of his work and that would be one to get to. But if you're a Rolling Stones fan, the 50th anniversary of that tour and these great photographs by Jim Marshall, Highly recommended, highly recommended. And these are the big guns now in terms of uh, price and something that's not for everyone. Very limited audience. I am a fan of Genesis Books. Genesis Books in 1980 put out the leather bound, limited edition of George Harrison's I Me Mine. Hand signed, numbered. I have a copy and then he put out a series of songs by George Harrison and they become this rock and roll a limited edition. They do these hand-bound leather books. They range from three hundred to seven, eight hundred dollars. Um, just gorgeous book. Tipped in images. Sometimes the photographs are inlaid. Sometimes there's uh, letters or art pieces tipped in, and just really wonderful. This is one that got delayed a couple of years. Obviously, part of it had to do with the pandemic. And lockdown, and I, I'm all in on the Beatles-related ones. And this is photographs by Mike McCartney. Mike McCartney is Paul McCartney's brother. He went under the name uh, theatrically Mike McGear for years with his band Scaffold. Uh, put an album uh, which is essentially Wings, but it's uh, Paul, Linda, and Denny Lane working on an album with Mike McGear called McGear. Fantastic album. He took some of the most beautiful pictures, early pictures, obviously, because he was right there clamshell case. These are very um, limited and expensive. This one comes with signed photographs that he took. This is John and Paul rehearsing together.
So Mike McGear. Mike McGear's early Liverpool photograph by Michael McCartney. And lastly, probably my favorite visual book of the year is this. This is The Birds, 1964 to 1967, by Roger McGuinn, Chris Hillman, and David Crosby. Again, it's very much in the design of the, uh, the Genesis books in a clamshell case. This particular copy is signed by the three living members, Roger McGuinn, Chris Hillman, and David Crosby. And it goes to their career of the first incarnation of the birds. Pretty much up through 67, the, when Gene Clark left the group, a uh, little overlap into 68, some of the photo sessions. So the birds uh, put together, produced by Scott Bomar on BMG Books. The birds, 1964 to 1967. Anyway, thanks for watching. Mazzy loves you. Read a book. Wouldn't hurt you to read a book once in a while.